Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum Allah khair for being here again. And welcome to the second episode of uh, Islam and Psychology. Um, inshallah, today we're going to talk about an exciting topic. Problems with psychology in the West. Uh, now, we touched about this a little bit last week, um, but I just wanted to preface this by saying that our approach here is not to completely tear down an entire discipline. Um, that's not what we're here to do. We're here to kind of consume it critically. Like, we're not going to say that everything that, uh, that is coming from psychology in the West is correct and accurate and true for us as Muslims, but we need to be aware of what are those things that are, you know, that are causing those issues so that we can, uh, you know, take psychology and to benefit from uh, the things that can help us learn as Muslims and leave the things that have nothing to do with us, inshallah. Um, so inshallah, I'll try to use simple language because I know there's younger audiences watching with us. But um, yeah, inshallah, we'll cover a few topics today uh, that are, you know, that are known in, as, you know, critiques in psychology. So inshallah, I hope you um, enjoy. So the first topic, and it's a topic that you're probably familiar with if you've taken any introduction to psychology course in anywhere, and it's the replication crisis. And from the name replication, um, the issue with psychology is every experiment, or not every, uh, most of the experiments that were done in the past are not replicating today, which means that you know all the studies that we have come to be familiar with from the 60s, the 70s, all of these like what they call like seminal studies, uh, we thought they were accurate, but when we came to redo them um, like in modern day, they're not replicating and giving us the same results. And a helpful analogy to understand that is, let's say we know that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Every time we reach 100 degrees Celsius, the, the water will always boil. Um, and that's kind of, that's the expectation. Like there's nothing that can, you know, happen differently. Uh, most majority of the times we do this, the water will always boil at 100 degrees Celsius. When it comes to psychology, we're not seeing the same results. Even when we try to have all the factors the same and we try to have the same like experimental design, everything kind of tried to keep consistent, we still end up bumping up against, you know, um, different results. You know, we get different results from uh, the 60s and they're not uh, repeating again today. Um, and that idea of, like, with that idea in mind, it's hard to build an entire understanding and basis with something that isn't replicating. And imagine right now, imagine all of these theories and studies that we came up with for the past hundred years. If they're not applying to us today, then what's the point of us kind of applying them and believing in them when they're not really applicable to people who are living in the modern day? Um, now, a lot of researchers have proposed reasons why this happens and, you know, the fact that people change, you know, people in the 60s are obviously not the same as people today. So it's important to recognize that as, as Muslims and not kind of be too excited about everything that's coming from uh, psychology. So, um, yeah, so those are kind of some of the reasons. Other reasons include the fact that uh, a lot of studies used uh, inappropriate methodologies. So maybe they used surveys when they should have used um, an experiment or uh, anything like that. Another reason is the fact that they've done it mostly on white participants and specifically white participants in America. And so when you try to get those you know, studies that were done on those people and try to do them, for example, in Turkey, um, you're obviously not going to get the same results because these are people with different values, different belief systems, uh, etc. And then the, the, uh, the last thing is something I mentioned earlier is changing times. Uh, people today are obviously not the same as people who uh, were in the 1900s. So it's important to be cognizant of that. Um, an example that I think is very, very popular in psychology and in um, therapy uh, accounts on Instagram, you'll hear of attachment theory and how the golden standard is having the secure attachment style. Uh, you probably have heard this or maybe uh, seen it mentioned in your social media feed. The interesting thing that's coming recently is researchers are finding that the golden standard of secure attachment isn't necessarily the same in every single community. So for example, uh, Americans or um, Caucasian individuals um, or European individuals might find secure attachment as the golden standard of attachment or the best standard, but other communities, let's say Taiwanese communities um, or um, people from Asia, are finding that a different attachment style is actually working better for them and is you know, helping them improve their relationships. And um, yeah, it's far better than secure attachment. And so instead of judging people or pressuring people uh, to try and to get them to change to secure attachment styles, 
um, there's an, a new movement or like other group of researchers that are pushing back and saying that, you know, maybe maybe we're being too fast at getting getting people to the golden standard that is set by the West. So that's just an interesting story to keep in mind. And I left references for you again to go back for um, and read. Uh, the second is a very important one, is, uh, and it's related to the replication crisis, and it's called um, the idea of psychology not being built on theoretical grounding or strong theoretical grounding. You'll notice that if, if you look at the field ever since kind of it formed, um, a lot of it has been experiments and studies, and you know people try to go back and formulate maybe a working theory to work with to work with the studies that are coming up. But the most exciting things that get published are often uh, studies or experiments without much of kind of the behind the scenes work of going back of like, okay, what does this mean? How does this relate to the mind and human behavior and all the things that are hidden? Remember last week, we talked about how psychology in the West focuses a lot on the outer behaviors, on the things that we can measure, either your facial expressions or anything you say in a survey, uh, an interview. These are all things that are outer, um, outer behaviors, things that we can measure. Um, but the inner things of like of the, the deeply philosophical ideas that we hear a lot as Muslims, and maybe uh, if you're familiar with any Greek philosophy, you'll hear a lot of uh, work being done on that, they're not really as discussed today. And that causes a problem because imagine if everybody's doing experiments on their own without going back to a main grounding theory or understanding, then we're, we're not really getting anywhere. We're just kind of building a few pieces without building like an actual um, building or structure. I hope that analogy makes sense, inshallah. Uh, another problem is the fact that each kind of concept in psychology has many, many different definitions. And one example that I personally worked with is the idea of belonging. Belonging in itself, if you put it in Google Scholar and search, you'll find up with, like, you'll, you'll come across so many different definitions for belonging. Each researcher is going to translate it in a different way according to their own study. They're going to, you know, tweak it a little bit so that it fits whatever um, research question they're asking. And that also creates a problem because then we're not kind of in agreement about what you know, belonging means. Um, even if it means kind of giving like three different definitions for belonging, at least that will get us somewhere, but there's, there's so many. So um, that's just one, one limitation as well that comes from the idea of not working from a theory or from a, a solid understanding. And um, yeah, and Islam, alhamdulillah, comes to complete that picture as we discussed earlier. And it, and it gives us whatever we we're searching for in terms of meanings of the soul, meanings of the self, how, how to you know, gain self-control, what are some of the moral values and religious values that we kind of um, go back to. So that's kind of where that covers it. Um, and there's a new movement with like a, a psychologists that are trying to bring back theory, most of it from Greek philosophy, but um, it's obviously, as we know, not going to be the same level as um, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's just one thing of like the layers of um, yeah, philosophy and psychology. The third thing, and this is maybe one of my favorites, is that psychology and people who are in psychology are obsessed with wanting to be a science. Um, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that I double majored in psychology and neuroscience, and that wasn't by accident. I also was one of the people who was fascinated by the idea of neuroscience and the idea of you know psychology being a legitimate you know biology that we all like, need to give it respect and it's one of the stem things and that's what, what we're not uh, we're not arguing that it's not the case what we're saying here is that we've become too obsessed with neuroscience and with psychology being like based on you know neurons and configurations of connections in your brain to the point where we've become blinded from the real image so um some of the bad you know the bad outcomes of this is that when we come to you know in, in a university and you're applying for funding to get money for your research if your research includes any kind of neuroscience piece it is more likely to get funding it is more likely to be an exciting uh, research paper and you know it will get published most likely so a lot of researchers are feeling the pressure to add neuroscience in their research even when it has no relevance um, and what we end up doing is we end up focusing on the the very very little details Imagine like to the level of neurons, which are like the cells in your brain and forgetting the bigger picture of what we're actually studying. And one of my favorite stories is learning about the idea of socioeconomic status and brain matter. So basically poverty and your brain. Um, and I learned this in second year. A professor showed us uh, research that she did with uh, children in Toronto. 
And they looked at brain scans of, um, of children from varying levels of poverty, um, from rich people all the way to people who are low socioeconomic status. And they found that children with, who are uh, coming from a higher socioeconomic background, meaning that they're rich, had a greater gray matter, which means more connections in the brain, um, more, uh, yeah, more cells and neurons that are growing in their brain compared to, uh, to children who have come from backgrounds of poverty. Um, and I remember when I learned that, I was like, wow, this is amazing. This is going to this, this is gonna change the world, right? Because we figured out there's differences in brain structure. But if you think about it, we've always known that poverty is bad. We've always known that. It's not, it's not a major finding or an innovative finding. And so having that in mind, it, it makes you remember that. Oh, yeah, like we, we ended up spending a lot of money doing these brain scans on, on children. But if you really think about it, we, we already knew the answer that poverty is bad for children. And um, we, we found that instead of like the things that we already knew are just being proven in another way. So for example, why, like just to answer the question for the people who are curious, why do rich kids have more maybe a gray matter or like more uh, connections? It's because rich parents can often afford to buy books, to buy toys, to buy games, to take them out to um, different um, environments so that their, their brains can grow and they experience new things. Whereas um, families of low income, are uh, they find it harder to get those things. They might find it harder to get them like the most innovative toys and the most uh, expensive books so that they can read. So it's not a matter of uh, judgment. It's just a matter of um, environment and where they grew up. So um, yeah, in summary, we knew that poverty is bad and with neuroscience, it really didn't add much, much value except with giving us a different perspective. Um, again, I, I don't want this to be like a complete critique and tear down of disciplines. This is just a helpful, um, a helpful, hopefully healthy way to think about the things we are learning and always being critical of them, inshallah. And the last slide, and this is something we always mention, but I just want to have like a, its own slide that we can dedicate so that we can understand this. Um, majority of the psychology studies have been focused on American people. So I'm not even saying white people here. I'm specifically talking about people in the United States of America. And we noticed, uh, psychology noticed that a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the studies that are published, 90%, this was a finding from, like, this is very recent, so uh, it's, it's a scary number. 90% uh, of the studies that are being published in top psychology journals are being done on American people. So imagine you're taking, you're taking like, uh, the majority of the discipline is focused on only one population in the world, and you're trying to apply it to the rest of the world. That's obviously not going to work out very well. So um, just something to keep in mind that why, why is it not going to translate very well? It's because there are differences in culture, differences in religious beliefs, assumptions about human behavior, moral values, self-regulation. So that's kind of one helpful way to think about it. And um, one example, I guess, that I wanted to bring up is the marshmallow test. You've probably seen this over TikTok, maybe. Uh, it's come uh, recently where a parent or a, a, a caregiver would leave a marshmallow in front of a child, and that child is asked to wait and not eat the marshmallow until the parent comes back. Um, and they focus on, uh, they the, the research question is that the kids who are, um, or sorry, the research hypothesis is that the kids who uh, can stay holding themselves and not eat the marshmallow right away are children who are higher in self-control and are more likely going to be successful. So that was, the, that was the findings of the study when it came out in the 1900s. When they did that study today, uh, they didn't find that that was the case. Um, they found that it's actually a better predictor of socioeconomic status than self-regulation. So it completely kind of teared down the idea. And if you think about it, like, let's say if we did this test on a, a Muslim sample, um, it's probably not going to be the same results because we have different definitions of self-regulation and self-control. Take Ramadan, which is coming up in six weeks, inshallah. That is an entire month about self-regulation and self-control. And if you leave a marshmallow maybe in front of a like, seven-year-old Muslim kid, he's probably going to be like breaking the scales, mashallah, of how much they're able to withstand, um, you know, waiting instead of not eating it because they're probably already doing it in, with their families in Ramadan. So um, that's just kind of one example to show you how something like this is probably not going to translate very well um, when, it, when it's applied to different cultures. Um, and yeah, I hope that was a helpful introduction. Uh, that is what I wanted to cover, alhamdulillah, today. Jazakumullah uh, khair for listening. Again, I'm leaving my uh, contact information here. If you have any questions, if you have any follow-ups or suggestions for topics that you want to cover about psychology and Islam, please feel free to reach out. Uh, aside from that, Jazakumullah khair and enjoy the rest of your day.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا حياكم الله أخواني وأخواتي وأهلا مرحبا بكم حلقة جديدة جديدة من الآخر في اليوم اليوم مع جديد مسلم دول رمضان 22 القادم بإذن المولى عز وجل حياكم الله هذا محدثكم أمجد قرش الذي يسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى لنفسه ولكم جميعا كبارا وصغارا ذكورا وإناثا أقرباء وبعيدين في الغرب وفي الشرق وفي الشمال وفي الجنوب المغفرة والرحمة والتوفيق والفردوس الأعلى من الجنة حياكم الله أحبتي في الله أنتم تستمعون لنا عبر تطبيق مسلم دو التطبيق التليفوني السمارت فونز اللي هو مسلم دو أبليكيشن أحبتي في الله اليوم هي الحلقة الأولى وستكرر لكم خلال الأسبوع بالعربي وبالإنجليزي هو جديد برامجنا عبر تطبيق مسلم دول لرمضان 22 باذن المولى عز وجل. اليوم النسخة العربية من الحلقة الأولى. يا أحبة نذكركم لمن يتابعنا للمرة الأولى ماذا نقصد بمسلم دو؟ ولماذا وجد هذا التطبيق أصلا؟ وكم مسلم دو يهدف الى تعريف المسلمين بالمراكز الاسلاميه، يعرف يهدف الى تعريف المسلمين بالمدارس الاسلاميه، يهدف الى تعريف المسلمين في كندا بدايه ثم المسلمين في شمال امريكا وان شاء الله المسلمين المتحدثين والناطقين باللغه الانجليزيه في العالم من مثل استراليا ونيوزيلندا وكندا وامريكا والمسلمين في ماليزيا وفي الهند وفي استراليا وفي اي دوله يتحدث بها المسلمون اللغه الانجليزيه. هذا التطبيق فيه تذكير فيه توضيح فيه شرح فيه تعريف فيه تعريف لك ان كنت تتنقل في كندا اين هي المساجد اوقات الصلاه فيه تعريف لك في منطقتك ما المسجد الذي تحب ان ترتبط به باوقات الصلاه سواء صلاه الفرض او عفوا سواء المواعيد صلاه الفرض او مواعيد الاقامه النشاطات المحاضرات الدورات التدريبية وإن أحببت أن تسهم بدعم مركزك أو مسجدك أو مدرستك أو أحببت أن تسهم بدعم فعالية أو نشاط معين في هذه المدرسة أو هذا المركز فالباب متاح لك بلمسة زر فقط فهي تسهيل وتوضيح وتعريف ونشر وإبداع في هذا الأمر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم سبحانك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك أنت المقدم وأنت المؤخر وأنت على كل شيء قدير أحبتنا في الله حياكم الله وأهلا مرحبا بكم مع جديد مسلم دو في رمضان 22 هذه عبارة عن تذكير وترويج وتنبيه لما سنقدم عليه في رمضان القادم وبقي بيننا وبين رمضان حوالي خمسين يوما فقط أسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يمد بالأعمار يا أحبة تعلمون أننا قد ابتدأنا معكم في مسلم دو الذي هو تطبيق خاص بالموبايل ومصمم لخدمة المسلمين في كندا ثم المسلمين في شمال أمريكا ابتدأنا في العام الماضي وأكرمنا الله بمجموعة من الضيوف ومجموعة كبيرة من البرامج نسأل, نسأل الله أن يكون النفع قد حل عند الكثيرين نحن مقبلون إن شاء الله في رمضان القادم ونستعد منذ فترة طويلة من فضل الله سبحانه وتعالى ومعنا الكثير من المفاجآت ومن فضل الله معنا الكثير من العناوين التي قمنا بدراستها دراسة مستفيضة وعقدنا الاجتماعات واللقاءات والمحاورات حتى نأتي بما هو نافع ومفيد فبين تربية الأطفال إلى عقيدة الأطفال إلى المسابقات إلى السيرة إلى التفسير إلى القراءات إلى تحفيظ القرآن إلى المسابقات العامة إلى التدريس المنزلي إلى التربية إلى الطب إلى المشاكل إلى القانون قانون العائلة في كندا المهاجرون الجدد القادمون الجدد برامج ما بين كبار علماء ومشاهير وما بين علماء مختصين وما بين دعاء مؤثرين وما بين مؤثرين من الشباب وما بين برامج شبابية برامج تطوعية برامج خيرية بإذن المولى عز وجل ستشاهدون سلة من الورود أو سلة من جميل ألوان الفاكهة أكرمنا الله بهم جميعا بحلة جديدة وقريبا سنبتدئ بإعطاء عمية الدعايات هذا طبعا عبارة عن تنبيه وتذكير 
وترويج الاستعدادي وعلى الله سبحانه وتعالى يكون من حمد الله علينا وأخاطب تخصيصا المسلمين في كندا ثم في شمال أمريكا أنكم مقبلون على وجبة غذائية روحية فكرية علمية وتسلية مباحة في رمضان القادم قد ربما لم تمر عليكم في حياتكم لأنها ستكون عبر الموبايل و... ولن تكون عبر ش... لن تكون عبر شاشة التلفزيون فبالتالي أنت بإمكانك أن تشارك وأن تسهم وأن آ... تدعم وأن تتابع وأن تعلق في برنامج هو أشبه ببرامج التلفزيونية القنوات الضخمة لكن عبر موبايلك في بث بحدود ثلاث إلى أربع ساعات يومية ويعاد تكراره مرة أو مرتين بالمجموع قد يصل إلى أكثر من نصف النهار بإذن المولى عز وجل فتابعونا وقريبا جدا ستنزل الحلة الجديدة بالتصميم الجديد الذي بذل فيه ربما آلاف الساعات من العمل من تطبيق مسلم دو الذي هو تطبيق خاص بالموبايلات أصله وهدفه صمم لأجل ربط المسلمين في كندا ببعضهم من حيث مساعدتهم على تعريفهم بمساجدهم ومركزهم الإسلامية ومدارسهم الإسلامية ثم المسلم دايركتوري الذي فيه أصحاب البزنس من المسلمين إذا أردت أن تبيع أن تشتري أن تتعاقد أن تستخدم أن تبحث عن الخدمات ميكانيكي مسلم سباك مسلم نجار مسلم كوافيرا مسلمة طبيب أشعة مسلم أخصائية توليد مسلمة هذا وهذه من حاجات الناس الطبيعية يحبون وهذا طبعا جزء رئيسي من الثقافة الكندية بالمناسبة بعض الناس يقول لك آه الثقافة الكندية تحت في تحت في بالتنوع في الثقافات وتشجع كل مجموعة على أن تستمتع بخصوصيات ثقافتها ومنظومتها القيمية بما ليس فيه اعتداء على الآخر لأنه إذا كان يسمعنا بعض الناس يعني من خارج شمال أمريكا يستغربون يقول لك أليس الأصل في كل مهاجر أن يتم ذوبانه في المجتمع لا أبدا ربما المجتمع الأمريكي يطلب ربما بعض المجتمعات الأوروبية تريد الذوبان وهذا ضد الفطرة البشرية المجتمع الكندي من ميزاته أنه يحتفي بالاختلافات وهذه يعني كما يقولون باللغة الإنجليزية they celebrate differences يحتفون بالاختلافات وهذا شيء طيب من فضل الله سبحانه وتعالى وهنا الأمر ليس خاص بالمسلمين المسيحيون لهم خصوصياتهم اليهود لهم خصوصياتهم السيخ لهم خصوصياتهم الهندوس لهم خصوصياتهم الأعراق والأجناس والذين أتوا من أوروبا الشرقية لهم خصوصياتهم والذين أتوا من الهند لهم خصوصياتهم سواء كانت دينية أم ثقافية أم عرقية أم يعني شيء عجيب جدا وكله يسير بطريقة لطيفة طيب والمسلمون من ضمن هذه المجموعات وعدد المسلمين حوالي مليون ونصف يا أحب هنا وبينهم من المختصين والقادرين وأصحاب الحرف والمهن والتخصصات ما لا يعلم به إلا الله بإذن الله تكون معنا الطاقات غالبها ستكون من الكفاءات الكندية من من المسلمين الكنديين من عدة جنسيات ودول في العالم لغتنا الإنجليزية ستكون بحدود 70% من مرامجنا وحوالي 30% إن شاء الله ستكون باللغة العربية لا تنسوا متابعتنا وإنزال التطبيق خاصة بعض أيام أن تقوم بتجديد الإصدار بإذن المولى عز وجل ابقوا معنا نسعد بكم هذا محدثكم دكتور أمجد قوش الذي يتمنى لكم التوفيق دائما وأبدا وأن نلقاكم على خير عبر شاشة تطبيق مسلم دو سلام عليكم رحمة الله وبركاته جزاك الله آل خير for being here so um, thank you all for having me again uh, the topic إن شاء الله that we're going to cover in the next few weeks إن شاء الله is Islam and psychology and so to preface that a little bit um, I am no expert I'm still a student in this field But what I want to do is, from these series is basically share a collection of very limited knowledge and experience that I hope you can enjoy along with me. So a brief background, um, I studied psychology and neuroscience for four years. Um, I did research in it, took classes in this, only to realize that there were so many gaps and uh, challenges in this field, uh, specifically because it's based out of the West and Western ways of knowing and Western ways of thinking. Um, and one of the courses that kind of stuck out with me and Um, are actually an inspiration for a lot of the slides that you will see is a critical psychology class. And um, for those in other disciplines, if you ever get the chance to take a course that where you can critique your own discipline, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, it will open your eyes a lot, basically. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so yeah, so that is where kind of I got um, introduced to a lot of the major challenges in psychology, um, such as the fact that, you know, uh, psychology in the West only focuses on what is observable, what is measurable. So only your outer behaviors and, you know, what you kind of um, say that your thoughts are, but it never focuses on the hidden, which is the soul and the spirit and all of that. Um, another limitation is that and this will come to discuss in later slides, is it has mostly focused on white participants. So a lot of like the white culture and um, the values and beliefs of the people in the West, those were the people that research was done on and theories were you know, based upon. And those theories can't necessarily apply to everybody around the world, especially not Muslims. Um, and at the same time, you know, as being a Muslim student in a field like this, it kind of, you know, you want to kind of either draw parallels or make connections between what you believe in and what you're studying. Um, but the, the truth is, the more you reflect and the more you read about the topic, the more you realize that Muslim um, scholars and basically like Islam and the Quran has way more content about psychology and the self and the soul uh, in a way that, you know, Western psychology has never even touched the surface uh, before. Um, so I hope that this kind of uh, these few slides are an inspiration for you to not fall into the trap and think that, you know, psychology is the answer for everything. If you're either on your, um, you know, on like a path towards uh, self change or self improvement or you just want to kind of improve some of the relationships in your, um, you know, in your life. Uh, to not fall into the trap that, you know, Western psychology will have the answer for everything, but encourage you instead to even look at back at our own sunnah and the Quran and what it says about, you know, all of these things that we care about. Inshallah. So I hope you enjoy. And uh, inshallah, at the end, I'll leave an email. If you have suggestions about topics that you want to cover or discuss, I would love um, to hear from you, inshallah. So let's get started. Um, so why psychology and Islam? So basically, kind of to take the root word of, um, you know, psychology, psyche means self, and ology means the study, so the study of the self or the soul specifically. But that, like, that field didn't really come, you know, from what we think the Greeks, because a lot of people think Greek psycholog uh, psychologists like Aristotle and Socrates are those uh, main scientists that brought psychology to the world. But the truth is, like, the science of the soul originated from Islamic tradition. And you'll find a lot of Muslim scholars like Zayd, Abu Zayd al-Balkhi and um, Ibn Sina and all of these uh, scholars talked about psychology and, you know, the science of the soul long before any of these famous scientists ever did. But in order to make this discipline appealing to the people in the West and make them kind of encouraged to study, you know, the soul and the self, because a lot of people were fascinated by physics and chemistry and STEM back then. Um, in order to make that discipline appealing, they decided to separate religion from the discipline. So removing kind of Islam and presenting just the science of the self to, uh, to the West and to the European scholars. And the reason why was because uh, people in the West were oppressed by the church. Uh, you know, it was, it was an oppressive system and it didn't allow for um, science and knowledge to grow. And so they, they needed to separate that. And I think that's where kind of the mistake for many, many other things started from, um, especially in Western psychology. So basically, having that in mind, Western psychology in the modern context, which is separated from religion, is insufficient at addressing basically the core problems that we have as Muslims. Um, Western psychology is focusing more, as we said before, on things that are observable. So your outer behaviors, your, um, you know, your different belief systems. There's also a new wave right now that says that, you know, there's like the postmodernist belief, which is that each person in the world is correct. And every person's lived experience is right in their own way. And obviously, we know that this is kind of against what we believe in as Muslims. So, um, yeah, so that is one thing. And the last thing, as I mentioned before, is that most of the psychology theories and studies were based on uh, white people who are educated, living in industrialized, rich and democratic countries, which is not representative of the whole world at all. And so that was why we need kind of an additional layer. And this is my favorite slide. So the history of Islamic psychology. So basically a lot of the things that we thought came from Western psychology did not. Uh, for example, talk therapy and cognitive behavior therapy, which are very, very popular methods and are still used today. Uh, they were actually proposed by Al-Kindi. 
And he proposed it in the context of healing depression. So he suggested kind of cognitive uh, techniques that you can train your mind to do a thousand years before, you know, cognitive behavior therapy was coined uh, in, in our world. And then psychiatric hospitals and institutions, uh, actually the first psychiatric hospital institution were in uh, Cairo and Baghdad since the 8th century. Um, so that's another cool thing. And they were actually very ethical. They treated the uh, patients with the utmost care. And if you read about these hospitals, you'll be, you'll be utterly amazed. Um, the third is recognition of anxiety and OCD symptoms. In fact, like Abu Zaid al-Balhi, uh, who is a scholar in Islamic um, psychology, since the ninth century has suggested that we, uh, we should use kind of therapy to uh, battle, like battle these obsessions that we, come, uh, we can um, have uh, from shaitan or from any other influences. So they were recognized long before um, Western psychology recognized them. And finally, the hierarchy of needs. So if, you ever, if you've ever seen the pyramid, maybe on like popular, um, so on social media or whatever, uh, you'll, you'll think that Maslow is the one who developed the hierarchy of needs, but it was actually Ibn Sina 900 years ago. Um, so feel free to take a screenshot. I also left the citation of the, um, like all of this content and where like the resources that I used from, if you want to go back and read the full article for the chapter. Um, and then before we go forward, I just also wanted to recognize uh, a small a small thing, but also very important. And the fact that us as a Muslim community, we um, we often also fall into the trap of, you know, believing Western psychology more than we believe in our own uh, methods and our own resources, such as the Quran and Sunnah. And the reason why this happens is sometimes uh, there's unfortunate and exceptional cases where somebody with uh, a mental illness that needs to be addressed medically, we end up kind of incorrectly assuming that they can... Um, they can only, like, the reason that they're mentally ill is because that they're not performing their salah well, or they're not reading Quran properly or understanding it. Um, and, and we end up kind of um, for like creating more harm for the individual who's facing mental illness as opposed to good. And same thing with hostile learning environments. Um, I don't want to talk too much about this, but sometimes we have like classrooms or school environments that, again, are very kind of strict Um in a way where the, the students aren't really learning about Islam, but are more in like living in fear from either a teacher or from, you know, the consequences if, um, if they're not performing well at school and especially in like an Islamic school. So uh, these instances might create um, spiritual abuse for people, which is like they're a little bit kind of um, defensive or wary of accepting kind of Islam too much. And that is very kind of special case needs to be dealt with careful professionals and uh, shiuch and imams who are trained in this. Um, and I want to say this because I don't want, like, I, I want to take kind of take you on this journey. And I don't want you to believe that um, uh, we, we, you know, we can only heal through Islam alone. Islam is definitely a great and important resource. And it actually is, I believe that it is the number one healing pathway. Uh, but it's also important to recognize that all of the other um, therapies and modes of healing are also they're not contradicting Islam. And that is what I want you, like I left it here to remember, is that uh, many Muslims benefit from Ruqya and Quran and using these treatments alongside treatments from, you know, like medical, medical treatments or, you know, either like a prescription drugs or anything like that. They're not in contradiction. In fact, they can be used together and we might uh, end up with amazing results when they're used together. So just a small reminder about that. And finally, is um, kind of the main theme of, I hope, inshallah, what the series will be about is um, Qalban Salima. And this is from kind of taken from the verse of the Quran, which you'll see, inshallah, in later episodes. Um, so basically, like, if you're not convinced already why we need to talk about this, um, you know, like some, some of us might think that Islam is basically just about worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, you know, trying to focus to get to Jannah. So why are we talking about you know, the heart and the soul and all of that. Well, you know, in, in the Quran, as we've seen in like many verses and uh, instances from the Prophet Sallallahu Islam is also about healing and changing your soul to the better, right? Always improving. Uh, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala emphasized in many times in the Quran that, like, you know, the true believer is somebody who has a sound heart, somebody who comes with a pure heart. Um, and may Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala make us from, from those people. Um, yeah, but someone who comes inshallah on the day of judgment with a clear heart you know free from envy free from conflict with others um is obviously has done a great deal of work on their own selves and that in, in itself is a form of worship so if you try to go back to kind of um the islamic roots and teachings uh, you'll find that 
you know, it is it is difficult to make sense of, you know, living life without understanding kind of the deeper deeper meanings of the soul, um, you know, things like purpose, uh, our main connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you'll find all of these in hopefully inshallah in Islamic psychology. And um, yeah, if you're ever like, you know, we, we get kind of sucked into by popular, popular psychology books or self-improvement books, or even if you have like the personal goal of being better with your families and improving your relationship with others, um, inshallah, I hope that this series will kind of open doors for you to exploring, exploring these ideas, not just in, you know, in research and like Western psychology, but also within our own faith as Muslims, inshallah. Um, and yeah, I hope this kind of gave you a little bit of a taste, inshallah, of what's coming. Jazakumullah um, alf khair. I left my email over here, inshallah. So if, if you come up with any questions or if you have a topic that you think would be really cool to discuss um, together, uh, Muslim do, inshallah, please feel free to reach out and suggest it. I'm more than happy to cover, um, you know, a topic like this, inshallah. Um, but yeah, Jazakumullah uh, khair for having me this week. And inshallah, I'll see you next week, same time. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Oh, my brothers and sisters, it was the ala come of you from Medina. Shout out to Muslim do. Inshallah, we'll be back shortly. We'll continue on with the art of parenting. From now on, we'll say salam for now. Don't forget to I won't forget you with that. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah wa ba'd assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh my dear brothers and sisters islam welcome back to another episode of the art of parenting this is your host brother Allah at your service inshallah asking Allah subhanahu wa jalla bila to make us among those to the speech of Allah the best of it and as he gathers here today he gathers with prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the year after in the highest level of paradise with now accountability but we have to walk the talk walk in his footsteps in order for us to pay our dues to earn his company. Ameen. Alhamdulillah. With that, we start. Now we talked about the pillars of the tenets of faith. We first talked about the love of Allah subhanahu wa jalla and the connection with him. And then we said the love of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the connection with him. And we talked about the stories of the companions, may Allah be pleased with all of them and how they actually loved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how we learn from that to become a better Muslim, closer to Allah subhanahu wa jalla fi ulat, closer to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and strengthen the bond between us and keep that tie and the rope between us and Allah subhanahu wa jalla fi which is the Quran, which we're we going to talk about today. The rope of Allah subhanahu wa jalla fi is exactly that. And the scholars will tell you if you ever want Allah subhanahu wa jalla fi to speak to you, just listen to the Quran. If you want to speak to Allah subhanahu wa jalla fi pray. So today we're going to talk about what are the importance of the bond between you and the Quran, the word of Allah subhanahu wa jalla fi from Al-Fatiha to An-Nas, from Jibreel alayhi salam over 1400 years ago, descended from the seventh heaven, that everything that you need to know about it and more. وَمَا فَرَّطْنَا فِي الْقُرْآنِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فِي الْكِتَابِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything is in the book. And if anybody tells you, well, you tell me this, tell me that, they say, you know what? فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Just a quick background, inshallah. Ask the people of knowledge if you not know. Just in case, okay, what is this and what is that? They ask you a lot of questions about it. And that is the answer, just in case you want. So please understand that why are we teaching our children the Quran? And why is it important? Because as Suyuti, al of the Suyuti, rahmatullahi alayhi, he actually says it's among the foundations of raising the children. It is, it's among the pillars of you raising a child. You also have to make sure that that Quran is a pillar. It is not the, the love novel on how to become successful. It's all good. Alhamdulillah, I'm not saying anything else. But the love has to be with Allah subhanahu wa jalla with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with the word of Allah subhanahu wa jalla with the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's exactly what it is. So it's very important for us to do this on an early stage. And I understand that, you know, a shafi rahmatullahi he memorized the Quran when he was seven years old. He memorized the Muatta when he was seven years old. <laughs> Allah musta'ad. You know, he used to say, شَكَوْتُ لُوَكِيعًا سُوءَ حِبْضِي فَدَلَّنِي عَلَى تَرْكِ الْمَعَاصِي وَقَالَ إِنَّ الْعِلْمُ نُورُ وَنُورُ اللَّهِ لَا يُفْضَ لِعَاصِي He used to actually place his left hand on the left page so he would not memorize the left page before the right page. He had that, mashallah, photographic memory. So he wanted to make sure that he would memorize the Quran in, in order. So he would complain to his wakia, his, uh, his uh, scholar, his teacher. He said, I used to memorize so fast. What happened? I'm losing it. 
He says, he said, you know, stay away from the act of disobedience because the knowledge of Allah SWT is like a guiding light and that light will not be given to any act of disobedience. So may Allah SWT give us taqwa ameen because it's the key of knowledge as we mentioned before. Allah. You be conscious of Allah, Allah will grant you taqwa. So uh, one narration says actually that Shafi'i rahmatullahi when he was going to learn for Imam Malik rahmatullahi he wanted to test him before he accepts him to be a student. SubhanAllah. <laughs> So on the way, on the way over, <laughs> he memorized the Muatta. Allahu Akbar, Ya Sheikh. So what do we do when we travel, brothers and sisters? We memorize a song, we memorize a movie, we memorize Bollywood, we memorize all of that stuff. No, no, he memorized the Muatta, man. There was no WW this and no, that organ, that com and that net and all of that lovely stuff. They were old school, man. They learned the hard way, subhanAllah. So... It's the, the, matter, the matter of fact, the, the daughter of Imam Malik, he was actually, she memorized the motta, she would actually stay in the back. Any mistakes, they would make a, a subhanAllah, a knock. They would tell them, you know, there's some, some mistakes there. So please note that this is our, our job to make sure as a parent, to teach our children earlier on, make them love the Quran, bond with them, tell them the stories of the Quran, as we mentioned, and what the futures and benefits of the Quran. And every letter there is 10 reward, 10 hasanat. And the one that memorized the Quran is going to be raised so high in the heaven. And the one that uh, the, the, for you as parents, you will taj al a beautiful a crown that will be placed on your head when your child actually memorizes the Quran of the prestigious crown. And even some of the narration says that if your child memorizes the Quran or even starts the Quran, if you're in the grave, may Allah give you a long, healthy, righteous life. You will be alleviated from the heart of the hardship and the punishment of the grave immediately. Subhanallah. This is something that is amazing, a, a, amazing attitude and magnitude of us investing in our children, not just to learn French or Spanish or something else, but learn the word of Allah. And some of the scholars says, if you really want to learn Arabic, memorize the Quran. It will help you to memorize the, the Arabic. So it's a lot more than you think. But remember, not, I don't want you to memorize because we're going to have a section on Quran a little bit later, inshallah. But I'm just giving you a, a, a bit of a summary and a little bit of a down payment, paving the path to get there. So you have to also understand that the investment you're making is extremely important. It's coming back to you, yes? Because uh, if you help others do righteous deeds, you will get the reward for it also. So the futures and benefits will also help you. You also need to tell them what's waiting for them. Don't tell just, you know what, memorize the Quran. Don't do that. Tell them why you should do it. Uh, also, have a reward for them. If they memorize the Quran, have a nice halal, get together with their friends and the family. Be proud of them. You know, every time they say, you memorize the juice, okay, well, there's a reward for it. Now, I know that some of you will say, you don't have to have a worldly means for that. Actually, we are human beings. We're Basham. Like I know some of them, a shaykh said that, uh, I know some of them, they, when they memorize the Quran, says their father told me, memorize the Quran, I have a car for you. I have a, I had that bit with my daughter. So, you know what? She loves horses. So I told her, you know what? If you remember, I'm going to give you a horse. <laughs> so they're working on it. Alhamdulillah, the, the, the sheikh memorized it. And he had a car. So whatever it takes, you know their language and encourage them that way. And it's okay, inshallah. Don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about, oh my God, they're showing off. They're not doing it for the right reasons. No. Get them there first. I know some of them, a sheikh, got to the, to, to the masjid because there was a basketball. Now they're dua. They're among the greatest dua around nowadays. Allah. So we also have to speak their language. Don't make it this, this. So let them, um, when they memorize the Quran, you know, acknowledge that. Reward them for it because they want to be acknowledged. They want to be recognized. It's a positive recognition. And it's a positive uh, uh, enforcement. This is something that you must uh, do so. Every time they memorize a surah, every time they memorize a uh, uh, juz, you have to have something for them as a reward. And when they memorize the whole Quran, have a beautiful uh, halal party for them, for their family and their friends, everyone around them, and, and actually encourage them to do so. And that's one way to do it. Not just, uh, uh, you know, Al-Hafid al it says that is among the pillars, but in the Khaldun, it says it's among the banners that they must be raised by raising the children. This is something that's extremely, all the, the Sumaic scholars, all of that, they said that. And Ibn Sina, rahmatullah, he says this is the best way to teach your, your children Arabic. And that's how to actually, but believe it or not, you know what, I've been here for 43 years. I almost missed, uh, subhanAllah, 
the Arabic and I wasn't talking to it too much. I wasn't dealing with the Arabic community much and I was away. I was came in a very young. So I, it was very embarrassing for me to go back home and talk to them because I wasn't speaking well. So the only thing that really got me back was the Quran, subhanAllah. So the Ibn Sina, Rahmatullah, is speaking the truth. It's, I'm a living testament for that. So I started reading the Quran and started memorizing the Quran and all of a sudden I got the, 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 the Malaka. I got the, the stability and the ability and the genius of the Arabic language and the, and the science of it from the Quran, subhanAllah. So this is something that I highly recommend for everyone to do and also make sure that you pass it on. Also understand that when we talk about the uh, uh, Quran in itself, uh, uh, how to do it and what's the, what's the purpose of it? You know, uh, 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 Imam uh, Abu Hanifa Nu'man, alayhi, when a man came to him, he was speaking so quickly and all says, you know what, on my own and how do I actually have a concentration? He says, okay, read the Quran ka'annani astami'alayhi. Read the Quran as if I'm speaking to you, if I'm listening to you. But could you imagine if Prophet Muhammad sallallahu is listening to you? Could you imagine if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is listening to you? And that's what you should be telling them. And you know what? I always tell the, the Hufal, mashallah, you are an ayah. You are a walking ayah in the Quran. Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikr wa inna lahu lahabudun. It is for us to reveal, bestow the revelation and the scripture upon you. And it's for us to protect it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses you, if you memorize the Qur'an and teach your children the Qur'an, to actually be embodied of that ayah, a proof of a miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Qur'an, and you will get an abundant reward for that. It's amazing. So fill your heart with the Qur'an, cannot be filled with anything else. But I don't want you to be a parent. I don't want you to say blah, 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 and you don't know what you're talking about. So remember, Al-Umar al-Khattab, when he actually memorized 10 ayat, he would say, Ta'allamna al-ilma wal amal ma'an. We memorized the Quran and then we acted upon it after we learned the rules and regulations, ordained what is good for stay away from what is bad. After we walked the talk, we moved on to another 10. And that's what my recommendation for you is all about. So please make sure that you do so and understanding what it is. And I'm going to leave you with one thing, Wallahi. It's a true story. I was actually in the car one day and uh, I had two cars next to me. One car was like, boom, boom, you know, all that stuff, Allah, like blasting it. The woofers are on, subwoofers are on so fast, subhanAllah, so loud. And another one on my right, subhanAllah, was a Quran, a mentibillahi or This is hell yes, Are they equal? La, Allah, they're not equal, subhanAllah. And finally, a, a true story. SubhanAllah, Sheikh, I, I, uh, I heard about this and I actually saw it. I saw the link. This is something that a father uh, of a child that when he memorized the Quran, he prostrated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to thank him. And he, they, they were both crying. In the same video clip, you will see another child crying. You know why he was asked why he crying? He says, because our football team, our soccer team lost. To and there he was so emotionally moved. He was so touched and he was like as if he lost or whatever. And look at the difference here. Look at the difference. The one he memorizes the Quran cries because Allah Allah bestowed upon it. Amazing Allah. Imagine in the last minute that you have this choice. A choice of being a carrier of the book of Allah, if you have anything else other than that, subhanAllah, don't belittle that. Don't ever think that you were granted something else that's better than the book of Allah. That's your bait, and that's your challenge, and that's what I'm going to leave you with. Asking Allah, subhanahu wa jalla bila, to make us among those who speak and follow the best of it, and guide us to the straight path, be among the people of the Quran. Why? Because that's the people of Allah, subhanahu wa jalla bila, on judgment day. Aina ahli, where's my family? أهل القرآن family of the Quran may Allah make us among them أمين وأخذ دعوة الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلّى على آله وصحبه وتابعين زك الخير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى the most compassionate the most merciful all praise and thanks are due to him and peace and blessing to be upon his beloved Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم he who is guided by the will of Allah no one can misguide him and he who is misguided no one can guide him except Allah سبحانه وتعالى I do bear witness that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Respected brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum Wa Barakatuh. This is your brother, Dr. Amjad Qarsha, broadcasting through Muslim Do application from Canada, Ontario. Peace be upon all of you Muslims and non-Muslims. Respected brothers, this is my first episode in English in, the, in this season, and it's my first episode in English about our new programs in Ramadan 22. 
In today's reminder, we are, I will just give an idea for anyone who's not aware of what do we mean by Muslim do application. Then I will give a general idea about what we are planning to do in Ramadan. Then we'll, I will ask you respected selves uh, for any kind of feedback in the coming uh, days, inshallah, so that we can uh, adjust, prepare, design, uh, in addition to our already plan and design after your feedback to be well, fully, inshallah, uh, prepared in an excellent way. Now, Muslim Do application basically is an application that has been designed to connect Muslims through Canada. It's to let about 1.5 million, who are the population of Muslims, more or less in Canada, to know about the Islamic centers of each other, about the Islamic schools, about the, the time of the prayer, the time of the iqama, the time of the adham, then about any kind of events, any kind of activities, so that someone uh, would love, for example, to participate in an activity or an event for himself, herself, his, her family, uh, so that they can attend, they can watch through online, they can be there physically. They would love to support their masjid, their madrasa, their Islamic center. It's just by pressing a button, then you can donate easily in a very well-protected, secured, end-to-end, uh, end -to -end, uh, you know, a transaction, financial uh, tool, like what you do when you go to any kind of supermarket in Canada. So uh, Muslim Do application basically contains, in addition to that, a directory uh, that will come soon that Muslims, they will be able to know about the business people of uh, their Muslim colleagues, you know, the professionals of them, the doctors, the mechanic, the plumbers, the, uh, you know, the people who working in any kind of spa, in uh, hairdressing, in anything that you can imagine, Islamic food, cultural Arabic Islamic food, if you would love to know a Muslim mechanic, a special, for example, Khaliji, Gulf, or Egyptian, or Palestinian, or Lebanese style of food, uh, homemade things. You know, if you want to, to have your hair cut for ladies in a special places, for a hijabi sisters, you know, all of these benefits, this application is designed, it has been working for hundreds and hundreds of hours by a team of tens working and they spent tens and hundreds of thousands to design this application. Now, one of the simple tools of this application to let the people know about it, the application is Muslim Do Application TV, which is the one that you are witnessing now. This is just a simple tool of the huge uh, application. Application contains tens of features. A lot of benefits, the big umbrella of benefit connecting Muslims together in first of all in Canada, then in North America, inshallah, with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so now, uh, last Ramadan, we were blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we had more than 100 guests, about 20 or less celebrities from the great scholars of the Islamic world. About 80 of the guests, interviewers, you know, guest speakers presenters in many, many different uh, types in Islamic fiqh, Islamic tafsir, Islamic hadith, Islamic faith, creed, aqidah, medical, uh, you know, things, something has to do with the vaccination last time, uh, about business, professions, advices, many different types of many things, alhamdulillah. And the last 10 months, we were doing different seasons, about three or four seasons, different types. We had around at least more or less 100 new guests. And mashallah, some of them, they are common guests since Ramadan. So in 50 days, nearly 50 days from today, we will start Ramadan 22, inshallah. I think the first or the second of April. So we are, we've been planning since weeks and weeks, months actually, if I'm not mistaken, at least I'm sure from weeks, uh, we were planning to make a very well-prepared new Ramadan, inshallah. So basically what I'll be doing, I will give you a general idea now about the main themes and titles of the programs that we will be tackling. 
then uh, I will let you know that Alhamdulillah, inshallah, in the coming episode, we will announce to you a special uh, way of communication so that you can give your feedback about if you would love to suggest a title, a topic, a problem, any advice with regard to the program of Ramadan, inshallah, with the Mawla Azza wa Jal. So we will be having, inshallah, in the, this coming Ramadan. By the way, we will be broadcasting every day, 30 days by 30 days, at around four hours a day. And the four hours, they will be read, broadcasted, uh, recorded at least twice a day. So you will be having a broadcasting of an average 12 hours a day multiplied by 30 days, inshallah. We will be uh, witnessing success stories, something about the tarbi and education of our children, competitions in different types. We have special messages from celebrities of scholars, big scholars. We will be talking about... Uh, uh, the, the, the educate the, about you know uh, raising and bringing up the children, how to plant the seeds of faith in the children, the homeschooling, the new community based homeschooling, Islamic thoughts, the family counseling, marriage counseling, Islamic centers, and the big heroes of Canada, the youth issues by youth, Ramadan issues such as the juridical things, the fiqh things that are related to Ramadan, daily news of Muslims around North America. We will have some kind of munshideen and inshad and nasheed, new rivers or new converts, Islamic centers. We will be having something about the recitation of the Quran, the ijaz of the Quran, the stories of the Quran, the seer of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the law in Canada, family law in Canada, some kind of most important low issues with regard Muslims and new immigrants in Canada. And we will talk about initiatives, solutions for the society, how to protect Muslims from being melted in this big boat of different cultures, Muslims and politics, Muslims and media, Muslims in Canada, faith, faith for our kids, and Muslim and sport, Muslim and happiness. So we have many titles. Uh, some some of them are fixed programs, some of them still titles, and we are still in the process of counseling and consulting. Uh, you know the the people who will be introducing these beautiful programs. So inshallah, all of these titles or most of these titles will be in a, in a inshallah you will be witnessing them in this coming Ramadan. So this is just like a announcing, given an idea in the coming episodes. In Arabic and in English, I will be giving you a specific about each theme of them. Sometimes a specific programs, I will be highlighting what we are expecting. So please, from next time, follow us to suggest. If you have a, an idea, if you want to suggest an idea, a theme, a problem, a person with the justification of how this idea, this program, this person could be very beneficial for Muslims in Canada in Ramadan so that we can study the case and to think how to consider and whether to consider. Jazakumullah khairam. The, inshallah, we will be with you every Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 6 to 8.30 in Ontario time by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From next time, inshallah, you will have a connection how to contact with the administration of Muslim Do application so that they can uh, have your comments and we'll try to benefit from them. Thank you very much for being with us. This is your brother, Dr. Amjad Qorsha, saying the salam from heart to heart of every single person of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descend his mercy, his acceptance, and let all of you be from the people of the Jannah. Allahumma ameen. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. Once again, I'm back. Uh, I know we've been covering this um, you know, last few topics, um, just because we're, we're taking our time with this, this, this um, topic. Um, and the reason we're taking our time, because this is a very important topic, because all other topics um, that we continue to talk moving forward would be somewhat contingent or dependent on this. Um, so when we did the, the beginning parts, we covered all the basic stuff, how to give dawah, I think more than enough is for average person to go out and start speaking to people about Islam. However, some people that may want to take their understanding a little bit deeper is why we're, we're, we're discuss discussing this stuff. So what, what we've been discussing is the uh, fitra and the first principles. 
Um, I'm trying to do some justice. Obviously, I'm not the best at this. This is not um, something I'm an expert at. Um, but alhamdulillah, I'm trying my best to uh, not only understand it for myself, that how I understand it for me and to be able to explain it. So I may have some deficiency. I have some, you know, some flaws. Um, if you like to go into deeper in this part, you can always uh, refer back to Sapien Institute, where uh, there's lots of topics that are discussed about this this topic in more depth and more detail, with more references, uh, more ayats and hadiths. So if you want to learn more about that, you can go there. Uh, if you want to learn just the basic dawa, uh, the go rap, how to call people to Islam, you can go to ira.org or just look up in Google. IRA training, Dawa training, and we have an, a really am, amazing, robust um, Dawa training that's, you know, uh, for most people to, to articulate. So what is the first principle? So what are the, what are the things we're talking about? So Bismillah, what we're saying today is that what we've been saying is first principle is something that can, that a principle that's a basic assumption that cannot be deduced any further. Okay. It's defined as the first basis from which a thing is known. Once you know what that thing is, then, then it's no longer a first principle. So what do I mean? We gave some examples. You know, like we give the example of the knife or we can give another example. You know, I can say, you know, why do you like your phone? Because it helps me. Uh, you know, if something you ask why, why, why at infinite, you won't be able to explain it. That something goes into, let's say, the unknown. That unknown thing is the first principle that you have to assume in order to move forward. And in any root of knowledge, there are some first uh, principles or some assumptions that we have to start with in order to build our understanding of worldview. So when you negate that, that first, you know, principle, then you're negating yourself. So for example, you know, why do you like this phone? Cause I can call my friends. Why do you, why, why do you like the phone? Cause I like my friend. Why? Because my friends are, good to me and, and I want to hang out with them. Why? Because they're, you know, that they, they make me happy. Why? Because, you know, I spend time with them. Why? Uh, because, you know, they, they, you know, they t guide me to do good things. Why? Because they are, you know, um, uh, I mean, if you just keep the, asking that question at why at infinite, you won't be able to answer that question at some place. You have to go to a place, which is the unknown and that unknown is, which is the unexplainable is what we're talking about is the basic assumption. So there's many unknowns in all spheres of knowledge. For example, you know, your consciousness, you know, it's, you can explain how your brain works, how neurons work, how you exist, but what is consciousness is something we, you know, even science can't deduce. They could take your brain and put it on a, on a scope and they can see all these neurons firing, but you can't explain what is conscious, what is what is uh, consciousness or what is yourself, you know, your, your nature, what are you, you know, what is you, um, you can't explain that you have to assume that you are you and you have to go from there. But the, the opposite is true as well, right? If, if you say that you don't exist, then everything becomes absurd. Or if you say you don't have a brain, then everything becomes absurd. How do you know what you know? How do you know everything that you know? So you can't live in this world to negate this first principle, first assumption that you have to start with. So this is what we're kind of building that. So now everybody must be asking, what does this have to do with Dawah? So what we're basically saying is this thing that we're talking about, many, many things come under that. Like, for example, you know, if, if you see, we gave some examples like, the, you know, the Niagara Falls, you know, you, someone could say to Niagara Falls, beautiful. Someone else could say, no, it's not beautiful. You know, um, you know, these things that go in under the, you know, the part of the, the first principle, that feeling of Niagara Falls being beautiful, that cannot be explained. It goes down to something that we cannot explain. We just have to have something inside us like the allness, like, wow, this is amazing. Or, you know, you know, it's something we have to just, it's innate in us. So basically what we're saying is many things have that, like, you know, smell, for example, you know, someone can say this smell smells great. And the other person says it smells bad. You can't explain that feeling or that smell because it's something you have to just accept that I like this, you know, or I don't like this aesthetics, 
you know, colors. I mean, all of these things are unexplainable. If someone, if you tell someone I like the color blue, but if you ask them why, you know, they say because it makes my eyes feel good. And we ask, keep asking why. You won't be able to explain why someone would like the color blue or why I would like the color green. It's just something it is. So this is what we're talking about. So how is that link to to what we're talking about? Because even in that, when we're talking about rationality, it's part of the, the innate as well, that it's something is inside you, that we accept something is logical. So like what we talked about last week, like, for example, when we saying logical, anything that's logical, right, we accept. But why is it logical? We just can't explain. We have to just accept it. Because if we say it's not logical, then we have to, you know, everything just becomes absurd. So, for example, here's here's one of the first principles. We're just when someone says, you know, all bachelors are unmarried men. Right. So what does that mean? Uh, can we have a bachelor that's married? I mean, we're not talking about Islamic thing. We're just saying the term married and bachelor go synonymous. You know, if someone says, if you're a bachelor, you cannot be unmarried, whether you've been married once or whatever, it doesn't matter. But what we're saying is this is a logical conclusion. Why that conclusion is the way it is, is something we have to accept, something we have to start with. Because these, this idea of logic is sits in there as well right in in the first principles that we have to assume that innate we believe in logic we believe in rationality uh we believe in these things that but we cannot explain why they're logical so in the same way what we're saying is you know if we say all bachelors are unmarried can you you know negate that principle no because it wouldn't logically make sense so what we're saying if all bachelors are unmarried men John is a bachelor, therefore John is unmarried. This is, you know, um, you know, uh, it's a logical conclusion that we we accept, right? If we negate that, then why are we negating that? And what makes it logical is what we're talking about. That's something we're saying that it's logical. Is something what we assume, which is innate in us. So logical re- reasoning, imagine, you know, like, so, uh, you know, what we're saying is even the logical reasoning is, is part of the, the fitra. It's part of the innate disposition, right? So this is something we have to assume, we have to start with in order to move forward. So what we're saying is, so all of these assumptions that we have about us having a mind, uh, you know, uh, us being alive, uh, you know, the, un- the universe is, you know, the nature is in conformity. We gave some example. All of these things, we have to accept logical reasons, to, you know, what's logical. We have to accept that. But if we had to explain it, you know, at some point, if you keep asking the question, why, why, you won't be able to explain it. This is something when we're talking about, it's, you know, the, it's not the part of the logical or illogical. It's something outside of it. So that something outside of it is what we're saying is the super rational. That super rational in Islamic terminology, theology, what we're saying is that is something that's innate, right? That's something inside you, right? So what we're saying here is the tools of rationality and logic cannot be proven or disproven the principle um, uh, because it was outside of rationality and logic in some ways, just like that, the rules of the games are not the game. They only allow the game to happen. Any rational or logical system must have something outside of itself to work. So that's, we're saying, let's call it super rational. Now that super rational is something that we are saying that's innate, you know, which is inside you, innate, natural disposition. I mean, it's natural and it's logical that it's inside you and it's in your disposition. So what we're saying is what that means in the, in the Dawah context that we're going to talk about, that's something that relates to the Islamic theology. What we're saying is it's the fitra. It's the innate disposition. Okay. So, you know, the word fitra comes from the root letter of, you know, fatara. So fatara, right. It stems from, you know, from what's innate. So as you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, every child is born on the state of fitra, and then his parents make him into a Jew, Christian, or Majin, fire worshiper. Um, so what we're saying is if all human beings were to just, 
you know, were left alone in the natural state, if everybody was in, uh, you know, monolithic worldview with everybody believed in the one true God and everybody moved forward, your, your fitra would stay, you know, upon the truth. It would upon be on the right thing. But the way sometimes this fitra can get clouded or can get corrupted, it could be many, you know, the ulama of scholars say for many different reasons, it could be the sins. It must be maybe the company you hang around with, maybe the things that, you know, you're, you're kind of, you know, seeing around you, all of these things that are having influences in you that sometimes clouds the fitra. So what we're talking about is we see that, you know, that the Prophet is saying that every child is born in a fitra and then the parents make them Jew into Christian Megan. So what we understand that, you know, you know, naturally, when we're talking about, you know, believing in one true God or a creator or first cause, that's innate in someone, right? Someone has to teach you, you know, contrary to that, someone has to teach you Christianity, someone has to teach you, uh, you know, atheism, or someone has to teach you these things, but innate, you can't reject that there's a first cause. If you reject there's a first cause, you're rejecting what is being is being you you should be able to deduce that if you're here there must be some first cause that created or started this whole process now at this time we're not saying this is allah we're just saying there has to be a first cause there has to be a creator when you negate that you're kind of negating yourself right so and everything that about you you're negating as well so for example you know when we talk about justice OK, we can't just say justice is just a mere idea. It came from nowhere. It has to. There has to be some being that is just that gives us justice. There has to be some creator that created everything. Everything can't create itself. Everything can't come from nothing. So in the same way, everything becomes absurd. Justice, truth, truth can't come from rocks. Right. Rocks don't have, you know, they're not animated. They're not alive. They don't have consciousness. So you can't get truth from rocks. You can't get justice from rock. You can't get, you know, all of these things from, from uh, you know, non-animated things. For what we're saying is, as human beings, if we have all of these things, where did they come from? Where did, you know, where did we get all these things? So what we're making a claim that inside you innate, there's something in you that has the capability to know that there has to be a first cause. So, for example, I give this example in sometimes that imagine, you know, you had a toy when you played as a kid and you haven't seen it in 20 years. If you were to see that toy 20, 30 years later, which you haven't played with, you know, is there any new knowledge that you acquired by seeing this, this toy? No, you didn't because it's something that's, innate in you you remember it's a recall of a memory in the same way you know when we're saying that there is a first cause this first cause has innate put it inside you to find this being so the signs of this creator whether you're looking at the creation whether you're looking at you know yourself who you are why you're here what's the purpose of your life you know there are all of these signs around you that should awaken something inside you and, you know, sometimes what happens is we in life are in just sometimes heedlessness, kafla, right? We may be busy working. We may be, you know, uh, hanging out with the wrong people. Maybe, you know, we're doing all of these naughty things that our, our fitra sometimes gets clouded. So what happens is sometimes these, this fitra, when it's clouded, right? Uh, these are just some quotes from, you know, uh, scholarship from, you know, uh, Imam Ghazali or, or, you know, different, different, uh, you know, scholars, I'm sorry, Imam Taymiyyah, uh, what they talked about the fitra. So what I wanted to say is to, when we're talking about the fitra, to awaken the fitra, sometimes these are the ayats of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Um, you know, many people, their fitra was awoken, you know, uh, by hearing the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, ayats that hit them deeply, right? And sometimes that can affect people. Like we had this one brother, you know, I, I've, you know, he, you know, read the ayats where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says "Nur ala nur, nur upon light." So he reflected upon that, you know, like light upon light. What does that really mean? Light is just light. Like there's a light here, but when he's thinking deeply about where does light, where does nur, 
where does that goodness come from, right? Um, it reflected, you know, and, and he thought deeply about that. And that led him to, you know, investigate about, you know, what is good and where's God and why am I here? What's the purpose of life? And there's many other stories. Like there's one sister in UK, you know, uh, I was watching a, a thing on the YouTube and she was explaining that I had all my questions answered. Every question I asked in Islam, they were answered. I just asked one last question to the sheikh and the sheikh said, you know, she's, and the sheikh said, what's the question? She says, where is God? Now, obviously in Islam, we believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is outside of creation, outside of time, outside of space. And there's many things in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ and the sahabas that, you know, that reflect back to that, that we believe the creator doesn't become the creation. It's distinct and disjoint. It's not part of the creation. But anyway, so this girl, you know, when the ayats was, you know, showed to her that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is closer to you than your jugular vein. And that hit her really hard because she understood that as soon as she dies, you, she will see her maker or she will you know, be you know, in front of her maker in some sort of way. So sometimes ayat waken the truth within the people, right? So what we're saying is obviously we believe that all of us should always be trying to approach you know, humanity at large. But the best speech, which is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, always try to explain to people or show them what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, right? And that should be our default first position, you know, um, and it's very, very highly effective. Um, you know, many people have become Muslim because of ayats of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, you know, one guy in UK, you know, when he heard, Kullu Allah wahad Allah samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad, wa lam yakullahu kufu wa nahad. And this, it just shattered everything for him because no, even though he was an atheist, he understood the concept of God because sometimes other traditions always mix God in the creation. He said, you know, this is so, uh, you know, precise and, and perfect of what I, if there was a God, this is what I would want the God to be like. You know, kullu wallah wahad means what? Say God is one. Allahu samad mean he is samad. He's, you know, absolute. There's nothing Def, you know, deficient about this being, right? He has no beginning, no end. So, He did not beget anything. Nothing was begotten. Him means the creator is not like his creation. He's distinct and disjoint, right? And this last one, obviously, brothers, if you're giving dawah to explain to, to this, this last ayat is so stringent that if you apply this to anything in the creation, it would fall onto it. Means it will not work. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying there's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what we're saying is you apply that to any human being that would stand up and say, I'm God. Anyone would say this, you know, statue is a God or this tree is a God. Any kind of being that is created, anything that's created would put to that, would negate it. So sometimes the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very, very powerful uh, to awaken the truth from within. Um, and this is, I would say, it's probably the most effective tool in our tool set. Um, but the reason why we, we're explaining this is because sometimes what happens, brothers and sisters, because, you know, we like to get into these discussions and, you know, and we've been programmed to be watching the last 20, 30 years of, mashallah, some amazing duats. They've done some great work. Uh, but it's become the narrative to, you know, we have to debate with people. And, you know, from my limited understanding from, you know, when you're in Jadal, when you're in discussions and argument, you're not winning any hearts. You're just winning people's mind. And even those minds can be changed, right? As you know that your your heart is always wavering, right? It's, it's your kalb is always turning, right? You know, that's, you know, the, the Hadith Prophet, you know, someone can be born a Muslim in the morning and be a disbeliever at night, you know, so your kalb is always is shifting. So what I'm saying is basically that just because you've given them, you know, a, you know, a very good rational argument, you know, it may get that person to understand and it may not. Right. Um, however, it is another tool and there's many other tools, like, for example, experience. You know, um, you know, many people come to Islam because they see another practicing Muslim and it's an experience, you know, like even Sheikh Abdul Rahim Green, uh, one of the things hit him right in the beginning that he saw this, 
you know, one of the his employees for his dad was, you know, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And and that really affected him. And many, many people, they've they've seen Muslims worshiping their maker. Now, if you just listen to my words, I keep saying worshiping, I'm not saying prayer. Because for people, prayer is going to the, you know, the temple or the Gurdwara or, you know, or the mosque. Uh, or, you know, or someone can say, well, prayer, I pray all the time. You know, we could say, oh, we pray five times a day. Someone can say, yeah, I pray, you know, 20 times a day, a hundred times a day, because for some people, prayer is dua asking, you know, somebody can be walking around saying, I pray all day long, brother, you only pray five times a day. So I'm not saying we're in competition, but what we want to say is we are worshiping, we're doing salah. So the word salah comes from the root one, sil, which is what is to connect. So one of the brothers gave a very good example of Salah. He said, you know, if this phone is connect, if not connected with Rogers, Bell or Wi-Fi, even though it's a very expensive phone, it's useless. So in the same way, Salah connects you with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if the person, you know, when he sees someone else connected, that experience might affect that person. So sometimes you know, positive experience, sometimes even negative experience. We we'll gave an example one time, one sister who had a baby and she said, I want to be good. And she said, what defines good? And that get her to, you know, learn and investigate that. Why am I here? What's the purpose of life? What is the truth? And where does the truth come from? And she became Muslim, right? So sometimes negative and positive experience affect people. And sometimes, yes, rational arguments work with some people. It's not the only root of, of, of discussion, but this is one of the ways I'm not saying it's the most effective, but what's happened in the Dawah brothers and sisters, why are we saying this is because this has become the norm. We only have to argue our way to convince people that Islam is the truth. This is actually counter Dawah. This is against the Dawah. So the narrative we're trying to address with the Duat, especially if you're out there speaking about Islam, that we have to really change this narrative and, you know, we don't see the Prophet ﷺ arguing with people to accept Islam, right? So we have to really think if he's our teacher, if he's our role model, we don't see him doing debates, you know. Uh, sure, our ulama defended Islam, right? Very knowledgeable. And some of them did, did jadal, but they wasn't because that's what they wanted to do. Sometimes it was brought upon to them. Sometimes there was a need for it. So I'm not saying that no one should be doing this, but. You know, but this is not dawah for average person. But what's happened is every person that does dawah, this is the only thing they know is I'm just going to prove to them how the Bible is wrong. Or I'm going to prove to them how logically it doesn't make sense. Or I'm going to, you know, all these kind of, you know, uh, is counter dawah. It's going against the narrative. So we want to change that for ourselves first before we want to share with others that this is not a very effective tool. But there is a place and a time for it sometimes. You know, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, argue with them in the best of ways. So, yes, but this does not mean being disrespectful. This does not mean to belittle them. And I see stuff online all the time. I see stuff on YouTube where, you know, people are just completely disrespectful of people. Do you think that you are going to win their mind and their heart with your, you know, the way you're treating them? I don't think so. I don't think people will. I'm not saying Allah knows who is the one who guides, but still. This is a very bad approach. So yes, have discussions, explain your way and have those, you know, rational arguments with other, with respect, with, you know, with hikmah and wisdom, uh, but be mindful, right? Um, and obviously sometimes reflection and introspection can awaken the truth within, like someone was saying, you know, when the plane is falling, there's no atheist on that plane. You know, um, or the, when the boat is sinking, there's no atheist. So sometimes when you think about why I'm here, what's the purpose of my life and why am I going through all these struggles? Sometimes these things awaken something within the people as well. So many people, their, their fitra or their innate disposition, which sometimes gets clouded by sins, lies and all these kind of things can be unclouded by, you know, any one of these things that can you can. So what we're trying to say here is you have multitude of tools in your hands to awaken the truth for within for someone. So don't always rely on rational arguments, right? You know, use, you know, some wisdom, you know, that is someone is trying to understand the person having empathy, you know, reflecting on where this comes from. What is his question? Does he understand what he's saying? 
I don't have a limited amount of time, but just some of these things, as we discuss more and more, I'll be bringing up some more points as we move forward. But these are some ways to uncloud someone's fitra, their innate disposition to awaken the truth within. So this is what I wanted to leave for today. Jazakallah khair for all of you for you know uh, being patient with me on this topic uh, of the first principles and the fitra, the innate disposition. Um, you know, if you want to get a hold of us, um, obviously our website is ir.ca. Um, if you have any questions regarding how to get involved with Dawa, you can reach us at admin at ir.ca, public relation or PR at ir.ca, or if you have any questions for myself, uh, aosman at ir.ca, uh, or you can go to any of our websites at IR Canada, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, so on and so forth. Um, and you'll see lots of work that's activities that are going on. Um, so Jazakallah khair, all of you. Thank you very much for your time. Inshallah, we'll pick it up next week. Uh, and everything that I said that was good, that was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything I said was wrong, that was from me. So Jazakallah khair and Assalamu alaikum everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome again to Muslim Do and welcome again to another another session inshallah so in today's session last session we spoke about islam and the importance of salah uh, in today's session we're going to continue on the same path and the path that we're on is hadith Sidna jibril so if any of you have the time and have the ability you can look at the arba'in nawawiya you'll see hadith jibril where he comes to the prophet وسلم, and it's a long long hadith he says what's islam and now the second portion of it is is it is what's iman what is belief and the, the hadith says, he asked, the Jibreel asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what is Iman? And the Prophet responded that Iman billahi wa malaikati wa rusuli and so on and so forth. But that's not what I want to focus on. Because that's something that's internal in the heart. The ulama have already explained to us, Al-Iman ma waqara fil qalb wa saddaqahu al-amal. Right? Iman is what's in the heart and your actions are, you know, the proof of your Iman. Right? So having Iman and saying, oh, it's a connection between me and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, is not the Muslim way. It's not the Sunnah of the Prophet But indeed, the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, is to put your ilm into amal. You put your learning, what you know, into action. And what we're talking about today in particular is having that paradigm shift, right? So, so often in our lives, we're, we're, we're told, oh, have that connection between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Iman is a spiritual thing only between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yes, a big portion of Iman is between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yes, that you can't take that away. The Imaniyat and the Tazkiyah are very important. But the actions that we have, the things that we do dictate whether our Iman is truthful or not. Whether we're truthful with our Iman. And there's a few lessons that I want us to take. The, the Prophet wasallam says, Iman is, seven, some narrations say 61 and some narrations say 71. Shu'ba. Um, Flames are like pieces, right? So we to attain our iman, we have to have all 71 of them. And the highest of them is La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. So let's just first understand La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah and talk about the ones that I want us to take, the amal portion of the hadith that I want us to take. La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah is to realize, is to be in the state of realizing that everything, every act that we take, every relationship that we have, every discussion that we have, it's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And is ingrained within ourselves that we live knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching us. And that is next week's class, inshallah, which is Ihsan. But the, the hadith continues and says, the lowest of the shab, the lowest of the pieces of iman is seeing dirt on the floor and picking up dirt off the floor. Removing the dirt from the floor. And, and everything in between. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this is one of the lessons I wanted to take. He tells us something so profound. He says, He's swearing by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, saying like, as if one of us today was to say, Wallahi, but this is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he knows Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He says, يتحابو. You will not enter Jannah. And you will not become believers. It doesn't mean you don't have belief. No, but your belief isn't complete. That one of those shu'ab, one of those portions of iman is missing in your heart. Not the, the not the core, but one of the portions of iman is not there and is missing. And he says, Until you love one another. 
And he says, "Ala adulukum ala shayin ida faaltumuhu tahabbtum afshu salama bainakum." He says, "Do you want me to tell you of something that if you do it, you will find this everlasting love and bond and and um, habba, um, love between one another, so that you can attain that iman?" He said, "Yes, O Messenger of Allah." He says, "Spread salam to one another," and this is one of the acts of amal that is evidence of our iman, right? So if we have iman, do we spread salam to one another? And the question is, do you only spread salam saying salam to the people that you know? Or do you spread salam to everybody that you see? And this is something that's so beautiful, so profound, especially for our sisters. Because our sisters are beacons of Islam, right? Every time one of our sisters walks in the public wearing hijab, they are a symbol of what Islam is. And yes, whether, I know it's a difficult banner to uphold and a difficult thing to have but yes you are representing our our religion and it's a lot harder for us it's a lot harder for us as muslim males to be shown as muslim because we fit in and we we blend into the community especially now that the beard is in style and everybody has a beard you can't tell if this person is muslim or he's growing his beard to look cool but the sisters they have a distinct look of hijab and when we see them in the streets, when we see them in the grocery stores, when we see them in public, do we say salam to them? Or do we let them walk through the world as if no one is around them, as if no one knows them? Right? And this is one of the things, one of the lessons I want today. Spread salam to one another. And this is the paradigm shift that I want us to have. Is that to realize, hey, I support you. I love you. I want what's best for you for one reason and one reason only. And that is because you worship the same God that I worship. Because you are Muslim and you believe what I believe. And that is enough for me. That is enough for me to love you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet says in another hadith, you will not attain belief. Right? You will not attain that belief that one of those shu'ab that you're missing, you're missing one of them. Right? If you don't love for your brother what you love for yourself. And that's the paradigm shift that I want us to have as believers today. I want us to have as, as Muslims in the West, as Muslims globally, that we see the problems of our fellow brothers and sisters as our problem. We see the success of our fellow brothers and sisters as our success, right? So when we hear that Muslims all around the world, like sadly we hear about the Uyghur Muslims, they're really struggling right now in, in a genocide. That should be our struggle. That should be our difficulty, our challenge. And yes, does it become overwhelming? Of course it may. But we do what's best to our capabilities, right? And this is where the amal kicks in. The Prophet says, Whenever any of you see something wrong, change it with your hands. If you can't do it, at least with your mouth, with your tongue. How? Talk to your MPs, talk to your MPPs, say, hey, my Muslim brothers and sisters are struggling in so-and-so country. My Muslim brothers and sisters are, are in difficulty in so-and-so country. But you don't even have to go to around the world. You can go down the street. So many of our Muslim brothers and sisters are struggling in our own backyards, are struggling with, with belief, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, struggling even with food. And this is the other portion, the Prophet in another hadith, time and time again, the Prophet is using the same tactic of saying you will not attain belief until you. He says you will not attain belief, complete belief, if you sleep hungry and your neighbor, is, if you sleep full and your neighbor is hungry. How many of our Muslim brothers and sisters in our community sleep hungry? Right? And this is our job as Muslims that are strong and empowered. We have to have this paradigm shift to realize, hey, we are one community. And this is the last hadith that I want to finish with before I re recap with our homework. The hadith of the Prophet وسلم, he narrates in the meaning of, he says, the Muslim's ummah is like one body. And we are all like one body. And think about your own body, right? If your body is feeling difficult, what happens? If your body is fighting off a virus or fighting off a bacteria or so on and so forth, many of us have had to deal with COVID in today's day and age. What happens? Your whole body becomes sick. Your whole body becomes ill. You become down because you're trying to fight off this virus, this bacteria. Well, our Muslim ummah is, is the same way. We are fighting off a virus, a bacteria, a difficulty, a struggle that we have. And it can't be 
oh, that's their struggle. That's not our problem. Oh, th- those are Palestinian problems or Uyghur Muslims problems or Egyptians or Syrians or Afghanis or, or, or our Pakistani brothers or sisters. They're not, it's their problem. No, it's our problem. We are responsible, every single one of us. And that starts from your house. First, look at yourself and empower yourself and then empower your family and then continue to expand that circle to the best of your ability and stand with the truth wherever it may lay. Now, that's our homework. How are we going to take this action and, and implement them? The first and foremost thing is have that paradigm shift. And that's something we have to do by sitting with ourselves and assessing it with ourselves and then talking about it with our families. Telling them, hey, the Muslim problem, the Muslim issue is our issue. Every struggle that Muslims have globally is our struggle. And we want to work together in any way that we can to help our Muslim brothers and sisters. And that's how we're going to work to become better in our Iman and strengthen our Iman. Number two, and this is something we can do practically right away, not just in our minds, but practically day in and day out. We're going to walk, and every time we see someone that we know or don't know, as long as we know that they are Muslim, as long as we know they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're going to go to them and say, Assalamu alaikum, and send them peace and blessings. So every person we see, whether we know them or not, and the Prophet was very vast in his statement. He says, if salam, spread salam to anyone you see, to anyone you know. Number three is love for your brother what you love for yourself. Love for your brother what you love for yourself. So if you see something good and you know there's benefit for it, bring your brother or sister to it. And that includes, for example, Muslim do. You realize there's benefit for them to, to come to Muslim do. Bring your brother and sister. You see that they're struggling with whatever, and you can offer your support, you can offer your service. Go and ask them, hey, how can I help you? Whether it be in school, whether it be in work, whether it be in any aspect of their lives, that's what you should do. And there's a beautiful story that came to mind quickly. I know I don't have much time, but quickly. The Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas was one sitting in the masjid of the Prophet Wasallam, And a man came to him and Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas was in i'tikaf. He was um, performing extended acts of worship. And in the masjid of the Prophet Wasallam, a man comes to him and says, Oh, oh the cousin of the Prophet Wasallam, I have this concern. I owe someone a debt and I need you to intercede for me. Because I can't pay them right now. I need you to just ask them to prolong it. And he was hoping that he would do it in a couple of days when Abdullah ibn Abbas had finished his atikaf. But what he realized was Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas got up instantaneously, gathered his shoes and started walking towards that, that individual that, that, had, that owed the debt, that had the debt. And this individual that asked for Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas's help ran after him. He said, oh, cousin of the Prophet Wasallam, I didn't mean now. I know you're doing atikaf. I didn't mean to disturb it. He says, I'm glad that you came to me. I'm so pleased that you came to me. The Prophet Wasallam has taught us that the person that walks in, in, for the sake of their brother, helps their brother, helps their sis, brother or sister, they are, it is equal to the reward of being in i'tikaf in the masjid of the Prophet Wasallam for two months. This is the paradigm shift the Prophet Wasallam wanted us to have. To realize that yes, we are all brothers and sisters. This is the true belief. When we, have, we believe that yes, I love you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the only reason I love you. I have no other intention except for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's number three. Number four. Now that we have our paradigm shift, we send our salams and we help people. We're going to do our best to make, to teach our children and teach ourselves the importance of being one ummah. We are like one body, one ummah, one community. And because we are, just because someone looks different or acts different or seems different, that's not a good enough reason to say that their problem or their issue. No, they're our brothers, our sisters. Their struggle is our struggle. Their difficulty is our difficulty. So we're going to stand up in every situation that we have and every opportunity that we get, we're going to help our Muslim brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us. I know I... I actually have two minutes, so I'm going to try to, to add one more story. And please forgive me if I go over, inshallah. Um, Sayyidina, Sayyidina, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, the time, of, the, time of the, the time of the Khilafah, right when he became Khalifa, there was a story, Sayyidina Umar, was, he was seeing a home of an older woman on the outskirts of Medina. And he, he realized that she didn't have anyone to help her. Thank you. She realized he had nobody to help her. Sayyidina Umar Khattab decided and said, you know what? 
because she's, I'm going to treat her like my mother, like my, someone from my family. So he decided to go and help her. So one day he goes and to try to help her by cooking her food and cleaning her home. And when he arrived, he realized her home was clean and food was already cooked and left. And this older woman said, a gentleman had just came and he had left before you. So Ibn Al Khattab said, you know what? That's fine. The first day, no problem. I'll come back the second day. And he came back the second day. And again, the home was clean and the food was on the table and ready. And Umar ibn Khattab said, on the third day, I'm going to come back, but this time I'm going to come early and make sure that nobody beats me. So he comes to the house of this woman on the outskirts of Medina. And this is after the time of the Prophet Sallallahu This is after the time the Prophet had passed away, but this woman is on the outskirts of Medina. And Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab comes and he realizes the home is not clean and food is not on the table. And he comes and he waits and he hides behind the home to see which man, which individual is coming to help this woman, to support this woman. And he sees Khalifa to Rasulullah the, the, the Caliph of the Prophet Sayyidina Abu Bakr walking in, cleaning this woman's home and cooking her food and leaving. And he realized this, this is why Sayyidina Abu Bakr, it's Iman in his heart to realize every single person is his brother and sister. Every single person is responsible to him. So everything that he can do, he was called a sabaq the one that raises to good deeds. Because he always wanted to support people, always wanted to help people. And he truly believed in his heart that Iman was there. And this is what the Prophet said and tells us about Sayyidina Bakr. It's in his heart, it's his Iman. And his Iman was shown in his actions. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to show our Iman in our actions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the highest levels of Iman. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, my dear brothers and sisters. Welcome to this very quick episode on the go, which is actually a Muslim do. Muslim do uh, do make uh, does make a difference in our life, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, for these blessings. And to remind each other and to team up with beneficial uh, topics. Today, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inject in your heart the benefit of this important topic, parenting, not bullying. In reality, your son, your daughter, they are not your punching bag. They are not your venting department that you vent your anger and you vent your anxiety against them. No, it is uh, actually a partnership. Parenting, partnering. Parenting, partnering. It is a partnership. And I'll come to this one after talking about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to show you how did he teach us one of the greatest tips about parenting, when he used to meet and see Fatima Zahra, may Allah be pleased with her, he used to smile in her face, greet her, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and get up from his seat, walk to her, kiss her in the fore forehead, and give her the seat. Look at that. Tabarakallah. This is real parenting. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best of Allah's creation, sees his daughter, Fatima Zahra, radiyallahu anha, greet her, smile in her face, walk to her, kiss her in the forehead, and give her the seat. How many among us does that? So it is parenting, partnering. It is a partnership. Why? Because when you get into a partnership in business, what do you want? Just to spend time? No, you want some. Profit, dividends, your parenting, it is a partnering with your children. Why? Because they are your extension to the Jannah. They are your bridge to the Jannah. So therefore, this partnership in the parenting process is supposed to give you children will make dua for you when you depart from this dunya. And they will get the certificate from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that means they are a good son or a good daughter. This is confirmed by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that parenting, partnering, is supposed to be an extension for you to the rahmah. These, these children, they're supposed to be your fuel of rahmah in your grave. And they were supposed to be the one who will make dua for you. And you are bringing them or upbringing them with goodness and kindness, this way also 
you help them to meet you in the Jannah. So therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, it is not always a nice talk. When the lady said, it's okay for her son, go, you know, it's okay, shabab, youth, go enjoy yourself. It's okay, never mind the salah. Wallahi, I buried him with my own hands. Beaten to death, thrown in the highway. They called me to bathe him and to bury him, rahimahumullah, and may Allah help his parents. So therefore, you cannot just ignore and cut from your deen to patch your dunya Cut from your Islam to patch your dunya and expect you to have good life, good children. It doesn't work that way. So therefore, parenting, one of the style of parenting, to monitor the children. We're not saying to spy on the children. A man actually, a very successful man, I told him, what's the secret of your children? So good, amazingly good. He said, sometimes I used to hide behind the tree and see who's their friends. I don't spy on them, but I want to do adjustment. I want to do certain overhaul to their heart and mind and thinking when I see there is a toxic relation. I want to be on top of things. So he's not spying, he's monitoring, he's adjusting, he's helping, he's providing them with support directly and indirectly. Speaking of parenting, my dear brothers and sisters, how many among us, you you call your son or daughter, you say, Ya Habibi. How many? I'll tell you. Go to the Holy Quran. You read it many times that Luqman, may Allah be pleased with him, he used to say to his son, Ya Bunaya. It's in the Holy Quran. Ya Bunaya, we think the translation for this, oh my son. No. The translation for Ya Bunaya means, oh my beloved son. My beloved son. So smoothen the heart of your children. According to Rasulullah Sallallahu When a gentle approach administrated in a matter, it makes it beautiful. Smoothen the heart of your children. Lubricate the heart of your children. Purify the heart of your children with a beautiful talk. Otherwise, some of those who are using their children as a venting headquarter to vent against their children, you are venting and bullying the most precious investment and the most precious treasure you have so therefore my dear brothers and sisters the man who kicked kicked the teacher of the holy quran knocking on his door where is uh, muhammad why why are you asking for him i'm the quran teacher or so you are the one he spit in his face and he kicked him truly this is a new a true story and i know the country right Months gone by, the man who humiliated the imam, the teacher of the Holy Quran, he came crying, begging him to bring his son back. Why? Because the son is beating his dad. The son became a drug addict. Yes. So therefore, don't bully your children's life by putting that divider between them and the greatness of the Holy Quran and the life of the Holy Quran. Today, just today, I got a call. A young lady, her dad wants to get her into riba. Riba. What's so called? Um, I, I have no other name for it except riba. Usury, but whatever you want to call it. Interest, no. Riba, pure riba. He wants to get her into that. I said to her, I will sign an envelope and he seal it. And give it to you that if you if you get into riba, that your dad wants you to get into riba to support him, the relation between you and your dad will be devastated. You may lose your health, he may lose his health, or you may have all the above, losing the health and the relation destroyed. So instead of helping your children to be big winners, you want to drown them into the fire of riba so therefore that's true true genuine organic bullying so my dear brothers and sisters i always believe might be a listener better than a speaker but let us just realize my dear brothers and sisters that do we have a parenting plan a parenting blueprint we're not saying we give them the blueprint of their life no 
Perhaps we are monitoring. Perhaps we are watching, advising, supporting. Lean on me. Lean on me when you are weak. But do we have a parenting blueprint? Do we have that? We Every parent, they must have a parenting blueprint. How am I going to raise them? What am I going to get from this hard work to raise them and to work hard for them and to sacrifice and to support them with dua, with my time, with my money, with everything. Do I have a blueprint for this parenting? I'm not going to suggest a blueprint, but there's nothing better than, absolutely nothing than the Holy Quran and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So inject that into their heart, inject that into their life, and you will see that you will have a great production. My dear brothers and sisters, Al-Amir Wal-Faqir, the poor person and the millionaire, their most concern is the children and most precious investment, it is the children. So therefore, we don't give them the blueprint of their life, but we have our own blueprint of how we're going to raise them to become big winners with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only by the help of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala and by the dua and begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma qihma al fitan, ma dahara minha ma fatan, means oh Allah, protect them against trials, against uh, uh, tragedy, against uh, tragic uh, testing. Protect them, Ya Rabbil Alameen, hidden or the one in the appearance. So, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, Allahu Akbar, another way of parenting, and here I'm not teaching you, I'm just reminding you, we're teaming up together in this wonderful program, Muslim Do, to give the community hand, to give you certain benefits for the rest of your life, to give your children trust. If you give them trust, this way they will come to you. Even if they're doing something wrong, they will come to you to complain, to uh, cry, to ask for a help, for a support, for counseling, for this, for that. Otherwise, the shaitan is ready to devastate their life. So give them the trust. Have good thinking of your children. Means husnil ban. I remember a person, he said that he spied on his son. That spying destroyed the relation. He said, I wish I did not spy on him. I wish I did. That's why there's a difference between spying and monitoring and keeping an eye on your children and asking and caring and paying attention. Wonderful brothers and sisters, another way about parenting and partnering to remember them in your dua, the dua of the mom and dad, the parents, very powerful, accepted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer your dua for your children and against your children. So be careful to make dua against them, no matter how hard or harsh they are, never ever make dua against them. When Allah sees in your heart that your child bullying your heart, but you are at most sadness, you are making dua, bitterness, you are making dua for your, your son or daughter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much more merciful upon them than yourself. So therefore, one way to make the dua, always add the letter mean. When you say, Barakallah fiki, say fikum. Barakallah fik, fikum. Add the letter mean in Arabic. And if you say it in English and say, may Allah bless you, say bless you all. So this way, all the children included. Wonderful brothers and sisters with this couple of minutes that I have left for this e extremely important reminder. For this crucial reminder, our children, our heart walking on earth, our children, our lung that we breathe within. So therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, one way to do with this topic, parenting, not bullying, to realize that maybe that daughter, you see that she look tough. She has a fragile heart. Be careful with that fragile heart. Maybe that son, you see that now he is taller than you, but realize he cannot survive without your dua. He cannot survive without your support. He cannot 
survive and thrive without leaning on you. Wonderful brothers and sisters, perhaps you forget everything I say, but realize that we must copy Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and enjoy a good life. Become a big winner when you copy Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this way it helps you to see the blueprint. How am I going to raise my children? How am I going to raise them to have a great production, a great extension so they can make dua for me, so we can meet in the Jannah. May Allah keep blessing you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by his rahmah, by his mercy, we could never flex our muscles and say by our deeds. No, by the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make us meet in the Jannah. If you found this or if you find this a speech beneficial, spread it. Muslim do is working very hard, wallahi very hard, to help you and help your children and help your life. Spread the benefit if you find this useful. Jazakum Allah khair. May Allah keep loving you, blessing you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most compassionate, the most merciful, all praise and thanks are due to him and peace and blessings be upon his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He who is guided by the will of Allah, no one can misguide him. And he who is misguided, no one can guide him except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I do bear witness that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Respected brother and sister, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is your brother, Dr. Amjad Qursha, broadcasting through Muslim Do application from Canada. Muslim Do application, as you know, we started with you last Ramadan. And alhamdulillah, we are just highlighting the good news that we will be with you with completely new version of Muslim Do application in this coming Ramadan. Inshallah, in a very short time, you will be having the latest updated version of uh, the app. And I'm bringing to you the good news that, inshallah, we will have a big number of celebrities, of da'iyas, of uh, imams. And we have a lot of topics, alhamdulillah, in this coming Ramadan, such as the faith of the kids competition, Quran recitation, uh, hadith, sira, uh, Islamic fiqh, different types, themes, uh, family, uh, Canadian law with regard the new commerce, Canadian law with regard the family. Uh, we will do our best, inshallah, to benefit as much categories, as, as much uh, sectors of the society as much we can. Uh, simply a quick reminder, just for those who are listening to us for the first time, Muslim do application was designed, first of all, to serve Muslims in Canada and to connect Muslims in Canada with each other by uh, making them aware of different uh, Islamic centers, schools, uh, masajid, uh, so that they can, you know, know about the facilities, about the activities, about any kind of thing that happens, and to be able to support their masajid, especially in the corona time. You can watch through Muslim Do TV what happens in your masjid, uh, any kind of events or activities. And you can support them financially by just pressing by one press by pressing a button, it's something less than one minute or two minutes. You can send a donation, like what we do when we buy from any superstore. When you use the Visa card, the credit card, you just tap it or you just press, you can support your masjid, even if there is a pandemic or there's a problem. Uh, and Muslim do application is adding, and you will be witnessing something really, really very beautiful, which is the Muslim directory, the business Muslim directory, which you will be able to know about uh, people of business, people of professions in your area, you know, and, and anything related to your life, your needs. Muslim mechanic, Muslim doctor, Muslim uh, technician, Muslim plumber, you know, whatever. You know, every group of people, one of the things that really we feel happy in Canada before it, which is they are celebrating differences. Unlike many other Western countries, they do not easily accept differences. In Canada, one of the core values that is making, say, Canada a good place for living is that they are celebrating differences, which means they don't look you down because you are trying to keep your identity or your culture or your values, as long as you are not violating the law or not attacking someone else. So 
because of this, Christians, they feel comfortable. Jews, they feel comfortable. Sikh, they feel comfortable. You know, Hindus, they feel comfortable. Muslims, they feel comfortable because no one is interfering in their own private areas. So because of this, Muslim do will be serving this very powerful, good, nice, let's say, aspect of the society, which is celebrating differences from one angle as a Canadian society. From Muslim angle, it helps Muslim basically to help each other, to know each other, to be with each other, to support each other, which is something really highly appreciated in the Canadian society. So please do your best to watch us, to download the new updated version of the app, uh, which will come very soon. It's a Muslim Do application on the Play Store and in the Apple Store by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have any suggestions about uh, titles of a new topics or um, some subjects to be discussed or you would like to suggest some uh, you know, some people to participate with us because you think they have a very good character or some achievements that we have no idea about them, you can uh, email us at muslimdo, uh, muslimdo at muslimdo.com muslimdo at muslimdo.com by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By this, uh, I think we came to the end. We will see you uh, this coming Wednesday between 6 and 8.30 with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is uh, Dr. Amjad Qursha uh, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to descend his blessings upon every single person of you. Assalamu alaikum.